So here we are in another LT 8-speed. This happens to be an L86 truck motor. It's a hot day here in Vegas, so I'm going to say it's about 107, even though the dash says 105. This engine is a little bit different because he's got a cam in it. I believe it's a Brian Tooley cam. It's not a big cam, it's a stage 1 cam, I think, and it's pretty mild. This Jeep actually has the stock L86 tune in it. It hasn't been modded, and it runs pretty good. Probably going to need a little bit of tweaking, but not much. This is an awesome combination, the 6.2 LT with an 8-speed. You got the choice of the L86, now the L87, which is basically the same engine with stop-start, or the LT1. The LT1 is available new from GM at a reasonable price. The L86, as far as I know, is not available new from GM, except for a long block. You can find them on the market now for better prices than a year or two ago, but they're still holding their, their price up. Wrecking Yards know these are all aluminum direct injected 6.2s, so they're not going to bring the price that far down. So really your choice now comes down to a new LT1 or a low mileage L86. And be careful when you buy a L86 used because if it's at a good price, there's probably a reason. Make sure you get one from a trusted source. You can hear the Camaro fan. This has a Camaro SS fan, which integrates perfectly with the Gen 5 LT operating system. It's run by coolant temp, air conditioning pressure, vehicle speed, trans temp, intake air temp. And you can hear this fan winding up and slowing down as needed. So why cam an engine? Back in the old days, we didn't have much choice. We didn't have variable valve timing. We didn't have direct injection. We didn't have a lot of the technology that we have today. And we were trying to get as much air fuel charge as we could into the chamber. So by going to a bigger cam profile, we got what was called more area under the curve. We would open the valve longer and we would open it higher or taller. And while that worked at higher RPM, it could cause problems at lower RPM. What we were counting on is the elasticity of air. As air was rammed into the intake at high RPM, the piston would start coming up from bottom dead center. And as the piston came up, it would start pushing the air charge back up. But if the incoming charge of air and fuel overcame that, the effective volumetric efficiency would increase. Volumetric efficiency is never going to be 100% in a normally aspirated engine the way we run them because you have restrictions like the throttle body, the intake, etc., the valve. With a ram effect, you can actually exceed 100% of volumetric efficiency because you can use that column of air, the ram effect, to get that air into the chamber even when the piston is coming up. And that's great for power at higher RPM, but the problem is at lower RPM, RPM as the piston came up, it would push the air charge back out into the intake, lower intake manifold vacuum, disturb the air charge, and you get that rump, rump, rump idle. So the modern engines are changing things a bit with variable valve timing because we can get a lot of the benefits of a bigger cam with VVT. Discrete cams basically have two positions, parked and open. So at low RPM, you advance the cam. At high RPM, you retard the cam. And you get a lot of the benefits that we got by putting a bigger cam in. Now, the LT is having high compression over 11 to 1. Direct injection and continuous variable valve timing are taking it to a new level. The bottom end torque of these LTs is tremendous. What that means is, even if you put a cam on it, you still got really good bottom end. I guess what it all comes down to is, what is your need? If you want horsepower, putting a cam in is going to get you more horsepower, but you're going to sacrifice a little bit of drivability. Some of the other things that you have to consider with a cammed engine are the torque converter if you're running an automatic. If you put too big of a cam on it, you're going to have to loosen that converter up. If not, you're going to be pushing on that brake pedal to keep your JK from moving because you're going to have to crank the idle up to 7, 8, 900 RPM to accommodate the cam. Two is catalytic converters. When you start building up a lot of cylinder pressure, it puts a lot of stress on the converters, and we've actually blown out lower quality converters, so you got to run a really high quality converter. And remember, when you put a bigger cam in, you're also changing the emissions of the engine, especially at low RPM. This vehicle is running a completely stock tune, and it has a cam that has been limited in travel. And of course, the cam profile is different than stock, so some tuning will have to be done. But given that, it runs pretty darn good even on a stock. This isn't a very radical cam. I think it's a stage one cam. So we still have a pretty decent idle with a stock converter. It still has good bottom end torque, and then of course, it pulls pretty good on the top. Another consideration when you put a cam in, is, of course, is tuning. LTs are getting easier and easier to tune. A lot of the LT operating system is self-learning or works off of what we call adapt. So things like spark knock and fuel delivery, transmission shifting, learn as you drive. Now they can only learn so much. Adaptives have limit. Like if your fuel trims get plus or minus 25, 30%, you're gonna reach that adaptive limit and then you're gonna start throwing codes and having issues. So you have to modify or change the tune to match that cam profile. And that can be tricky because the drivability of your vehicle is gonna really depend on the quality of the tune that you get. That's true in any kind of modification, whether it's air intake, exhaust, 
exhaust, supercharging, you gotta make sure that you have a good tune. Now this JK I think is running really good with a stock tune, so it's not gonna require much tweaking to get it where he want to be. I will say that I think there's less and less need for bigger profile camshafts. I grew up in an era back in the 1970s when cams were the way to get power. Freer flowing intakes, bigger carburetors, Holly 750s, 800s, bigger camshafts but there was always a compromise. Whether it was drivability, emissions, I remember big block Chevys putting out 500 horsepower, but they'd make your eyes water because of the hydrocarbons at low RPM. You're putting out 1,000, 2,000 parts per million hydrocarbon on some of those radical cams. That just wasn't good for the environment or anybody. Today, technology has captured a lot of that performance that the big cams gave us, but kept the drivability and the emissions. So essentially what this all comes down to is how much air fuel charge you can get in the chamber and cylinder pressure. So the continuous variable valve timing, combine that with the transmission because the transmission is an important part of engine performance. The transmission can help keep the engine in a peak performance range. So having more gears means we can keep that cam on the pipe longer than if you had, let's say, a four-speed transmission. An eight-speed transmission has twice the amount of forward gears and it's gonna allow that engine to run where it wants to run. So keeping the engine in an RPM band that it likes to run it, direct inject, high compressed, continuous variable valve timing means we can gain a lot of the benefit of getting that air fuel charge into the chamber that we used to get with the big cam without the downside of the rump rump rump. That's why these modern engines can put out horsepower equal to the older muscle car engines like the 440 Chryslers, 454 Chevys, the 460 Fords, while getting better economy and less emissions. Now if you want more power than that, you can go to a supercharger. So force induction basically means that we're taking a normally aspirated style engine and rather than putting a bigger cam profile in it to try to get more volumetric efficiency or more air fuel into the chamber, we're forcing it into the chamber. Turbochargers use exhaust gas to drive a turbine which then forces air into the intake. There's blow through systems, there's all sorts of turbocharger systems, there's stage turbos for less lag, then there's a the root style and a centrifugal style blowers which a lot of guys I think prefer in the Jeeps because I think with a root style supercharger you do get a little bit better bottom end response. There's been a lot of advancements in the centrifugal superchargers. I worked with uh, Joe Granatelli over at Paxton many many years ago. We've come a long way since then. We used to put a lot of horsepower out but sacrifice bottom end. You had to put up with a lot of supercharger wine but today if you go to let's say an LT4 or an LT5 or a Hellcat basically what we're doing is taking the architecture of a normally aspirated engine putting a supercharger on it and now forcing that fuel air charge into the engine rather than count on atmospheric pressure and vacuum to suck it in. Superchargers are almost unlimited on horsepower output you can just keep cranking them up until you blow the engine up which a lot of guys end up doing. You want to really start off with a solid engine if you're going to supercharge. 3.8 really was never designed for a supercharger and it was never designed for a two bar operating system in the JK. This is very important because when manufacturers do OE superchargers or forced induction, whether it's a turbocharger or they have a two, three bar operating system. So when that operating system goes from normally aspirated atmospheric pressure into boost, a lot of things change. You have to have a map or manifold absolute pressure sensor that knows that you're going from atmospheric. And atmospheric pressure is really negative pressure because basically it's the column of air pushing down on the earth. So the higher you go, the less column there is and the lower density the air is. So at sea level, you're going to have a lot of air density. At 12,000 feet in Colorado, you're going to have lower air density. And one of the reasons superchargers were developed really was for military use because during World War One, normally aspirated fighters could only go so high. They would get to a certain altitude and the engine performance would just drop off because there was no air up there. Same thing when you take your heavy Jeep up the Eisenhower Pass in Colorado. The air gets thinner and thinner. You lose about 3% power for every thousand feet you go up. So if you go up 10,000 feet, that's a 30% loss in power. If you take a JK with 200 horsepower and you're losing 75 to 100 horsepower in drivetrain loss and then you get another 30% loss through altitude, you don't have a whole lot of power at altitude. Well, fighter planes wanted to go higher. They wanted to get up to the Zeppelin. Then in World War II, bombers were flying at high altitude and fighters had to get up there. So supercharger and turbocharger technology grew in leaps and bounds during the war. And some of the technology was top secret. Like if you look at the P-38 Lightning, the turbo superchargers they fitted to those engines allowed it to run at high altitude. The P-51 with the Allison engine was a good low-level aeroplane, but when they put the Rolls-Royce Merlin in with a blower, it changed it into a, one of the best high alt fighters in the industry. And what it really came down to was getting the engine to perform at altitude. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here with our vehicle. After the war in the 50s and 60s, a lot of guys would take the blowers, military blowers, roots blowers, and they 671s, whatever, and they'd put them on their small block Chevys and big block Chevys. You guys remember seeing those stick 
sticking out of the hoods of the old muscle cars and hot rods. But supercharger technology has come a lot further than that now. Their big manufacturers are making specific built superchargers for these engines. You look at the TVS blowers, you look at the LT4, you look at the Hellcat, they're very refined. They're integrated into the operating system so they're almost seamless. What that means is the drivability doesn't suffer. You still have a good idle. The whine is minimal, but you can crank that boost up to whatever you want. And you guys know that there's 550, 650, 750, 800 plus horsepower OE motors now. You can buy L5s right through GM Performance. You can buy Hellcat, Demon, Elephants. We're taking engine performance to a different level. Unlike the 70s and 80s, we're not just making the engine radical to get horsepower. We're using technology to get horsepower. Now, do you need 800 horsepower? Probably not. I worked on a project for a guy named Reeves Callaway. It was a sledgehammer Corvette. It was, it was a force induction engine that was putting out incredible horsepower for the time. And while it was a little bit ahead of its time, it didn't have the refinement. It wasn't integrated as properly as modern engines are. If you drive a new Z06, ZR1, or Z06 Corvette, they're very refined. Sure, you can take it to Nuremberg and turn really good times, but at the same time, your wife can drive it to the grocery store. And that's just something that wasn't going to happen with a 7 to 800 horsepower engine in the past. So the good news is the aftermarket is jumping on the LT bandwagon and we're seeing everything that we saw with the LSs. Camshafts, the intake manifolds, the throttle bodies. So this engine is the future. You can mod it if you want. You can put a cam in it. You can put a supercharger in it. Personally, I think that you should just pick out the horsepower you want. If you want 350 horsepower, get an L83. If you want 450 horsepower, get an LT1. If you want 650 horsepower, get an LT4. By purchasing an OE production engine, you have access to an OE tune. And that's always a good thing because OE tunes always run great. They're conservative. They are designed for longevity. They're designed for emissions. They're designed for durability. And they have a lot of protection modes built in that when you have a modded engine, you eliminate things like hot protection, oil aeration. So by buying an engine with the horsepower that you want and then running a stock tune, in my opinion, has a lot of advantages. However, if you buy an engine and you want just a little bit more, going to a mild camshaft, going to a slightly bigger intake. I had a customer recently from New Mexico that took a 5.3 LS and put a cam in it and headers and did all the hot rod mods. And I got to say, that thing ran pretty hard. It ran, ran uh, probably as strong or stronger than a 6 liter. But the reality is you could still just buy a 6 liter. So in my opinion, if you want the horsepower of a 6.0, don't buy a 5.3 and mod it. If you want the power of a 6.2, don't buy a 6.0 and then mod it. Now the 6.2s are pretty much the pinnacle. Of course, there's larger engines and more powerful engines, but what's available to us at an economical price are these 6.2s, whether it's an LS or an LT, and they're awesome engines in stock configuration. And by the way, guys, we are a HP Tuners dealer now, so whether you want to tune your Chrysler side or your GM side, we can handle that for you. We can help you get the tunes. We can help you get the, the tool. It's just a great time for engine performance, and these GMs engines are on the leading edge like they always have been. There's some niche motors out there like the, the Coyote from Ford and, and the Hellcats and all that from Chrysler. But really, if you look at the mainstream, what guys are doing around the world, they're throwing in these LTs. They're putting in the LT4s, the LT5s, and there's, there's even going to be more coming out with the 10-speeds. And the whole aftermarket is jumping into supporting these. So it doesn't really matter if you're a Ford guy or a Chrysler guy. I have Hemis myself. I have Shelbys myself. It's not really about that. What it's about is what's available to you at the price. And I don't think anybody's going to beat the economies of an LT engine for at least the next four or five years. The cost of the engine itself and then the aftermarket support and the drivability with these high gear transmissions is just not matched at this point. So we're going to take this cammed LT to the mountain and we'll see how it goes. And I will say I have no reservations that this LT is going to perform excellent on the mountain. It's so mild that I can come to a stop and I'm idling at six or 700 RPM even with this cam. I think a lot of that has to do with the configuration of the LT engine. If I was in a 525 horsepower LS3 and I had the rump, 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 then and going through some of the tough stuff can be challenging. So we've got a bunch more LTs in the shop that I'm going to be doing some videos on and we'll come back and see you soon.